Do the Dead Sea Scrolls predict the day of Jesus' second coming? They do. And they might be right. In fact, I think they are. So let's begin this fascinating episode. Now, this is the day of the second coming, not the day of the rapture. So for everyone getting all excited that we cannot know the day or the hour of the rapture, we can't know it. But the day of the second coming is something entirely different. And the writer didn't predict the year of the second coming either, but he did predict the specific day when Jesus and the armies of heaven would return. And personally, I think he got it right. Now, most Christians don't know a writer of the Dead Sea Scrolls explained end times in detail. Even few modern scholars understand. Using only the Old Testament books of the Bible, he explained both the tribulation period and the timing of the return of the Messiah. In our previous video, we discussed this 2100-year-old Bible commentary called the Melchizedek Pesher. If you haven't seen this video, Click on the banner when it appears to watch it because it sets the groundwork for this one. But if you've seen it, you know that the writer based a lot of his analysis on the 70 weeks prophecy described in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Now these weeks, these 70 weeks are not weeks in our modern sense, but they're sets of seven year periods they're known as the 70 Shabuim, or sabbatical cycles of seven years. And the day of the second coming is based on these cycles. These sabbatical cycles of years are modeled after a Jewish week of days. Just as in a Jewish week, there are six days of work and one Sabbath day of rest. The sabbatical cycle of years was the same. Six years of work followed by a sabbatical year of rest or favor. This is where we get the modern term sabbatical from, taking a rest from your work. Every seven sets of these cycles of seven years, or in other words, 49 years, formed a jubilee cycle with the 50th year, the year after the cycle, being the Jubilee, and it would be the first year of the next cycle, starting another cycle of 49 years. So Daniel's 70 weeks are in reality 10 of these 49-year Jubilee cycles. Seven sabbatical cycles equals one Jubilee cycle. 10 of these cycles make up the 70 weeks prophecy. Now there is a modern theory you may have heard of, a modern Christianized theory, a Western sort of theory, that the Jubilee cycle was 50 years long, not 49 years long. But there was the 49 year cycle and then an extra year, a 50th year, was interspersed before the next 49 year cycle would begin and not that the first year of the next cycle was actually the Jubilee. This appeals to the Western mind who loves an even numbered years like 50, but it's not very Hebraic and it's not correct. And we can know that with absolute assurance because of the ancient book of Jubilees. Now Jubilees is not part of the canon of the scripture and it, it's certainly not something that we can take and say, this is divine inspiration. That's not what we're saying. But in the ancient book of Jubilees, the Jubilee cycle was 49 years, not 50 years. Now, this is a book that was read and appreciated by the apostles and great numbers of people during the first century. Although it is not inspired, the way they calculated the Jubilee cycle cannot be wrong. <laughs> or they would have rejected the book outright. No, the Jubilee cycle has to be 49 years long, just as we're saying. 
And in that way, Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy is 490 years, not 500 years. Now, let me state that again because I know it is controversial. Many gurus and scholars promote a 50-year cycle, but it cannot be. Because in the first century, the Book of Jubilees, that only had 49-year cycles, was very popular. And it wouldn't have been popular if it was wrong about its main point, how the Jubilee was celebrated. The 50th year was also the first year of the next cycle. That is how every seven years would be a sabbatical year, just as our weeks flow by with every seventh day being a Sabbath day. Now that we've settled that, let's return to Daniel's 70 weeks. The 490 years in total of these 10 Jubilee cycles provide a beautiful symmetry around the 70 year captivity of the Jews in Babylon. The cause of the captivity was an initial 490 years of not observing the Shemitah or sabbatical year, the year where they were supposed to rest. Then, after the 70-year captivity, an additional 490 years of restoration was to occur. Perfect symmetry. Leading up until the coming of the Messiah and the Millennial Kingdom, when he would reign. The Jewishness of this math is one reason the writer of the Melchizedek Pesher has such an advantage over modern scholars in understanding the end times. The timing of those end times are distinctly Jewish. But our scholars don't think that way anymore. They think Western Christian thoughts. But the 70th week of Daniel, or what many call the seven-year tribulation period, is the final one of one of these Hebraic sabbatical cycles. 69 of them are completed currently, and this one remains. It's a Jewish period of time based on the Jewish calendar. The 70th week is the last seven-year period of the 10 total Jubilee cycles of years, or the 490 years. In our last video on this subject, we read from this 2100-year-old Bible study or commentary by the writer of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The inheritance of Melchizedek, who will return them to what is rightfully theirs, he will proclaim to them liberty, thereby releasing them from the debt of all their sins. In that last video, we saw how the writer believed Melchizedek was God in the form of the Messiah. As you see, this writer assumes he will release the Jews from their sins. This section continues. This word will come in the first week of the Jubilee period that follows nine Jubilee periods. Then the Day of Atonement shall follow at the end of the tenth Jubilee period. When he shall atone for all the sons of light, and the people who are predestined to Melchizedek. So when the writer of the Pesher is speaking of the ninth Jubilee period and the 10th Jubilee period, this is exactly what he's talking about, the ninth and 10th Jubilee cycles of Daniel's 70 weeks. So if you want to know how ancient Jews imagined the 70 weeks prophecy as a whole, this is it. Nowhere is it explained better. And this writer refers to Daniel 70 weeks specifically later in the Pesher, of whom Daniel spoke, after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off. That's, he's quoting Daniel 9.26. The messenger who brings good news, who announces salvation, is the one of whom this was written. This, of course, is Jesus, the Messiah, who was cut off or killed to bring salvation after the 69th week of the prophecy after the first seven weeks, and after the next 62 weeks. And the writer, the Pesher, kind of understood this. 
Now we're starting to get to that portion about the day, the specific exact day of the second coming. But first, this writer seemed to understand that there would be two comings of the Messiah, just as we do today. An earlier one at the beginning of the 10th Jubilee cycle, a first coming. Here's what the Pesha writer said about the work of the Messiah during that first coming, releasing them from the dead of all their sins. This word will come in the first week of the Jubilee period that follows nine Jubilee periods. The writer realized the Messiah would be cut off and that he would save his people from their sins, which is pretty incredible stuff. However, he seems to get the timing just a little bit mixed up. One has to remember that the writer was composing this pesher maybe a hundred years or 50 years prior to Jesus. He didn't have history to go by. He was interpreting Daniel's 70 weeks as best he could. Now he envisions the first coming at about the 64th week. He calls it the first week of the Jubilee cycle after nine Jubilees. So 63 Jubilees is the nine, so 64th week. However, the correct timing was after the 69th week. The reason is the wording of Daniel's 70 weeks. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. The writer of the Pesher took this at face value and neglected to add the first period, the seven weeks, to the 62 weeks. But we can forgive him for this. It is much easier for us having the benefit of actual fulfilled prophecy to look back on. But the fact that he picked the 64th week for the coming of the Messiah is a clue. It's a clue that he was writing this before the 64th week because he would have then known that the Messiah didn't come in that week. So that's a clue as to the timing. We know then that there were at least five sevens or 35 years before the uh, coming of the Messiah in the 69th week. So it had to be in the BC area before the birth of Christ. However, and this is critically important, he properly places the Day of Atonement, which is currently known as Yom Kippur, at the end of the 10th Jubilee cycle, at the very end of the 70th week of Daniel. Then the Day of Atonement shall follow at the end of the 10th Jubilee period, when he shall atone for all the sons of light and the people who are predestined to Melchizedek. The writer of the Pesher places the end of the 70th week of Daniel on Yom Kippur. This is because the Jewish Jubilee year begins on Yom Kippur, as we see in Leviticus 25. So the Day of Atonement can only take place on Yom Kippur. And the writer realized that the day after the 70th week is the Jubilee and the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. So the last day of the 70th week must be a Yom Kippur. On this, he appears to be exactly correct. In our book, Revelation Deciphered from 2015, we discuss how all the Jewish feasts or feasts of the Lord might fit in with the end times. We were also convinced that Jesus' return to fight Armageddon will occur on Yom Kippur. So this Pesher that we're studying today is amazing confirmation from 2100 years ago that maybe we got it right. However, what I find completely incredible is how this writer foresaw two comings of the Messiah and his death in the first coming and also tied the second coming in perfectly to the 70th week of Daniel, including the final return on the final day, which is Yom Kippur. He also realized this prophetic period were jubilee cycles. Even to this day, most Christians mistakenly believe the 70 weeks are made up of prophetic years of 360 days each, as per Robert Anderson, a continual string of days, not really years at all. 
This sentimental idea is incredibly popular, but also mistaken. But a hundred years before Christ, the writer of this Pesher got it right. The years of Daniel's 70 weeks are Hebraic years, not man-made prophetic years. The actual day of the second coming being the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur is amazing enough. But also, this writer interpreted the war between the righteous angels and the wicked angels we see in Revelation 12 strictly from the Old Testament as well. And for his hosts together with the holy ones of Elohim, a kingdom of judgment, just as it is written concerning him in the songs of David. Elohim has taken his place in the council of the Elohim. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Scripture also says about him, over it, take your seat in the highest heaven. Elohim will judge the peoples. That was from Psalm 7, 7 through 8. Concerning what scripture says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. That's Psalm 82, 2. The interpretation applies to Belial and the spirits predestined to him because all of them have rebelled, turning from Elohim's precepts and becoming utterly wicked. We discussed this angelic war in this previous video. Interestingly, the writer of this Pesher refers to a few of the exact same verses from Psalms that we reference in our video. Psalm 82 gives the reason God will judge the evil angels, a reason that the Pesher writer also quotes, that the fallen angels have given partiality to the wicked as they ruled their earthly kingdoms. Later in this same Psalm, we are told God will kill these evil angels as if they were just humans. Okay, so the Pesher writer got the date of the second coming correct. That's Yom Kippur. And he got the war between Michael and Satan in heaven right. But what about the rapture? Now, the day of judgment itself is actually given by the Pesher writer as being referred to in Isaiah 61, to proclaim the year of Yehovah's favor, the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all who mourn. Isaiah 61, 2. Notice this verse refers to the time being both a single day and followed by a year period. In this verse, we learn that after the day of vengeance, a year of favor ensues. In another verse, Isaiah 34, 8, we learn that this year period is also called a year of recompense or payback. So God's vengeance or wrath also lasts a year. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. A third verse from Isaiah gives us a third purpose. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come. So Isaiah pictures three very different purposes for the final year of the 70th week of Daniel, all of which start on that same day of vengeance or judgment day. And unlike the perspective of many modern Christians, there are things happening after judgment day, taking place over a one year period. Recompense, redemption, and favor. And God's three purposes here are for three different groups of people. Recompense, or God's payback, will be poured out in this year on those who don't acknowledge Jesus as Messiah and who have mistreated Israel and Christians during the first six years of the 70th week of Daniel. We know this period as God's wrath. According to Isaiah 34, this begins on a spectacular day of vengeance, but takes an entire year to accomplish. During that same period, however, God will be doing a work of redemption. Redemption in the midst of wrath? It appears so. God has three purposes for three different groups. Who will he redeem during this final year of the 70th week? 
Well, certainly the Israelites who have not yet accepted Jesus as Messiah and also selected Gentiles who missed out on the rapture. There also is a third group. The year is also called a year of favor. And it is a year of favor for Christians raptured into the presence of God in the final year of the 70th week of Daniel. This Hebrew word translated favor is ratzon and better meaning of it might be acceptable, as in acceptable before God. So the third group is made acceptable before God for an entire year. It is the acceptable year of the Lord. This Hebrew word ratzon appears in Exodus in regard to the seal of God and the work of the high priest. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban. It shall be at the front of the turban. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate, with regard to all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. So here we see the word ratzon and the seal of God on the forehead appearing in the same passage. It was the seal of God that made something acceptable before the Lord. Now all Christians have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit with this invisible seal. And in Revelation, we see the 144,000 sealed with this same seal before they are raptured into God's presence after the sixth seal. This then makes one with the seal acceptable in the Holy of Holies, just like Aaron was. In this previous video, we saw how in Revelation 7, the vast multitude is before the throne of God the Father in heaven, acceptable before him for a one-year period, not seven years, not three and a half, and not a single day but rather acceptable during the entire acceptable year of the Lord. So when is this year when all these things happen? Well, it's the last year, the sabbatical year of the 70th week of Daniel in fulfillment of the sabbatical cycles in the Sabbath. When you have six days or six years of hard toil and then a seventh year of rest, and that will be the year of rest for Christians who are raptured into heaven for this acceptable year of the Lord. Then, in a final step of interpretation, the Pesher writer ties Isaiah 61 2 to the prophecy of Daniel, but this time to Daniel 7. Dominion that passes from Belial and returns to the sons of light. By the judgment of Elohim, just as it is written concerning him who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. Daniel 7's parallel passage is probably one you're familiar with. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole of heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Again, this shows an amazing understanding of end time events given by the Pesher writer who didn't have the advantage of a single New Testament writing. In our next episode, we're going to look at something almost no Christian is aware of. Did you know the Antichrist is attacking you right now? Although we don't know the physical Antichrist yet, his spirit is alive in our churches and preparing them for the great falling away. All our churches, even yours. If you want to keep watching, well, click right here. If the video hasn't appeared yet, take this time to subscribe and ring the bell notification so that you can be notified the minute this exciting continuation of our study comes out. This is Nelson, and I'll see you there.